Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to continue the Linux internal series, and today we'll be talking about syscalls right after this. So I guess uh, I'm going to call this part one, even though last time we talked about the protection rings, which is kind of the introduction, I guess, or part zero. <laughs> it was really the entryway into this. But uh, this is what uh, I think you, you folks wanted to see as some in-depth. And so I'll be going through all of the subsystems and talking about those. And so, But in order to get to those subsystems, you have to do a system call to access them. So that's why I thought I would start here. But there's some other information, some background stuff that we need to talk about. And, and that is the official names for what Linux kernel calls their subsystems. And there are five of them. There's the process, the process scheduler, or SCED, the memory manager, or MM, the virtual file system, or VFS, uh, the network interface, or NET, and interprocess communication, or IPC. If we're looking at how the dependency map works in the kernel, this would be a, a depiction of that dependency map. So let's take it from the top. Let's look at memory manager. So if an arrow comes out of memory manager, that means that it depends on what it's pointing at. So in this case, memory manager is dependent upon the virtual file system, the process scheduler, and interprocess communication. Uh, if you look at the, the virtual file system, it's dependent upon the memory manager, the process scheduler, and the network. Because some virtual files are NFS or Samba. Uh, they can also be Gluster and so forth. And so you do have virtual file systems that sit across the network. Interprocess communication depends only on the memory manager and the process scheduler. Process scheduler is only dependent upon the memory manager. And then finally, you have network interfaces, which are only dependent upon the process scheduler to work. So that's how you read that. And that gives you an idea of how everything is kind of knitted together. Most operating systems, I'm going to talk about this, are monolithic. Um, <clears throat> all that means is that the operating system is one big executable. And all of that part runs in the system space or kernel space. And the kernel binary contains all of those things we just talked about. The process manager, the memory manager, all that stuff is inside the kernel image. Linux is a monolithic kernel. But there are others, and one of them is the microkernel-based operating system. <clears throat> At the time that these were developed, and Mach originally was an example, is an example of that, but it originally was a monolithic kernel. But the idea behind it was to actually drop the amount of dependency on the, the kernel to do the work. So in microkernel-based operating systems, typically those these five functions, oops, let me go back out here. So these, these particular functions, only the kernel itself would be inside the protected. Things like your device drivers and your file system and your inter-process communication, your network, they would all sit out in user land. And in order to use those, the the work, the work, program or the application would send messages and those would then be picked up uh, by the uh, individual pieces that were in user land, the file system, the memory manager and all that stuff. And then it would go ahead and, and do whatever it needed to do. And of course, there was things that the kernel did too, and that would be to manage the process schedule. It still did that inside. It still does that inside, I believe. So yeah, and Mac OS is based on Mach. Uh, it's actually Zenu, X new, and uh, but it is a, der a, der a derivation of Mach. Micro uh, the micro kernel also handles things like the mass message passing itself. There are interrupts that it can handle uh, as well because certain devices have to have interrupts in order to uh, create uh, a, a direct memory access channel to push memory, uh, to push something into memory, and then they use the interrupt to inform the process that, hey, I'm done, the memory is there, you can get the data. And then there's low-level process management and I.O. as well. <clears throat> 
but there's more than that. Uh, <laughs> some people went, uh, if you look at the, well, let's talk about Axel kernel first. This one was to try to crush the amount of uh, kernel code that was inside of the system space down to the very barest of minimums. The program would sit out and whenever it needed something, it would just make a call to a library. And the library in turn would then make the privilege call to the system. So the idea was to allow multiplexing of requests at the same time to the same hardware. And this would allow uh, those requests to be queued up or to be executed if there was a way to do that in the hardware uh, to allow those to occur at the same time. The, uh, the thought behind this was really twofold. One, by doing it this way, it would free the kernel uh, from the actual waiting of the I.O. to complete. So they, it, it would be out of the way and it could go on and do some, work on some other uh, multiplex task while that I.O. was in progress. MIT did some research into this. This is kind of their design. I don't know of any OSs that currently use this. But I do know that the, I, the second part of the idea was hoped that by doing things this way that I could use the libraries and map them for Windows. I could map those libraries for Mac OS and I could map those libraries for BSD, and for Linux. It didn't matter what OS and what kernels were loaded into the system that I was running on, but I wouldn't need a virtual machine to run them, and I could have them all resident at the same time. So it, it provided to have resources and memory on the machine to do that, of course. But I, I mean, I can't imagine how Microsoft or, or Apple would react to something like that. I'm sure it would not be pleasant. Uh, but uh, anyway, that was their thought, and that was their idea. Uh, there's a, a hybrid kernel, uh, which kind of combines the, the, the attempts to combine what they call the best of both worlds. So attempts to combine monolithic and uh, microkernels. BOS was one of those. Haiku uh, is a modern version of BOS, and they do implement a, uh, a, a hybrid kernel. As I understand, Dragonfly BSD uh, is a, uh, a hybrid. I could... Now, if I'm wrong about that, let me know. I mean, things change, and my slides may be a little old. The data I have may be out of date. Uh, XNU, uh, of course, is the uh, mock-based kernel that which the uh, Mac OS is based on. is actually a hybrid. And Windows NT was a hybrid. It had elements of both, uh, the macro, uh, the uh, micro kernel, as well as the uh, monolithic uh, version of the kernel. There's also something called a nano kernel, which crushes it down even further. You may even see... Uh, even um, uh, smaller versions called Pico kernels. And th those are really trying to drive down to the minimal, the least amount of, uh, of system space and system code that's running. And, uh, and Key OS was one of those. I think that project's been defunct for quite some time now. It, uh, I don't know. It was, uh, I think, a research project originally. And... Uh, and it was kind of exposed. There were some people that played around with it when it was around, but uh, it, it didn't go anywhere as far as I know. And a lot of times you'll see that with operating systems. You'll see them, they'll, they'll come up the, in the academic world. It's more of, hey, I've got an idea. I want to go try it out. And they'll do that, and then they'll see who, who, who wants it. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, and if they don't want it, it dies, <laughs> dies on the vine. But uh, anyway... In order to interface with the hardware on Linux, you have a mechanism called the system call. And that interfaces with hardware and other resources on the machine, as well as uh, the process scheduler in order to get itself into the uh, run state, which is the whole, that's the whole thing that programs try to do is get themselves into the run state. But that frees the user from having to learn all of the details about low level programming having to you know, allocate memory, push something into memory that you want to write, and then then step by step, here's where I want to move it onto the, I allocate the disk space, I create the inode table, and then I, I insert the data that's in memory into that area on disk, and then I write the address to it in the inode table where uh, that file is, and then I close it and I move on. That just frees you up from all that low-level programming. The only thing that we worry about is open, read, write, and close. I mean, that's basically it. There are, of course, positional reads and positional writes, but but the basics from all that other stuff that has to happen is done by the device driver for us. And the other thing that system calls do is they increase system security because the, the user applications and user programs have no direct access to the hardware. 
So only it acts as a proxy, the, only the Linux kernel can do that. And then it increases the portability of programs. Uh, the, the syscall interfaces, if it's implemented consistently across uh, different distros or different versions of, of Linux, even different versions of Linux up to a point, would allow it, the same programs to be portable along that. Now, portability doesn't mean it will execute. It means that it can be recompiled and run. So if I'm su subscribing to the system calls for, let's say, Linux uh, 4.19, and I'm on an ARM processor, I can be pretty well assured that my application that runs will run in an expected way with the expected same results that, it, that a, a normal system call would get. So that's what that means. It means I don't have to do anything in my program to facilitate that. So what does a system call actually look like? So we have a user application here that's running in user mode and it's gonna issue an open command and this could be an open of a file. It could be, you know, anything, any kind of open. <laughs> open opens a lot of stuff. But in this case, there's a, it calls the, it, there's a mechanism that calls the system call interface. And that kind of hangs out on the bridge between the user mode and the kernel mode. And that will receive that call and then it'll process it. It'll set up a protocol and any architect architectural dependencies that are needed in order to look up and find where that open implementation is in the, it could be in a library somewhere and the, the syscall mechanism will go and do all of that. Then it'll load the library and then find the open and then pass the control over to it. The open then goes and does its stuff and it returns its result back to the system call interface, which in turn sends it back to the application. Uh, kind of a, a, a little bit different view of how that mechanism of the call triggers is that uh, the user process makes the system call. The system call executes a trap. A trap is nothing more than an interrupt, a software interrupt. It's not a hardware interrupt. It's a software interrupt that says, hey, I got some data, wake up. <laughs> and it's, it, and uh, the, the kernel will say, okay, I got it. And it'll make sure that it hasn't processed it. I think that's what the mode bit is for, make sure it hasn't already processed it. If, uh, if it hasn't, then it goes ahead and executes the call and it writes out the return and puts a bit that says one and hands it back to the system call interface on your application, which then picks up that data. So that's basically it. Uh, it's not a very complicated thing. Although, uh, the system call and the library functions operate similarly, uh, and that, that is by design, not by mistake. Uh, so yeah, it's, it, the calls to a library and the calls to a system call will look the same. Uh, and But the system call is implemented in the Linux kernel, not inside of a library, and there's a special procedure that's used to transfer control to the kernel. So yeah, there's a special thing that has to happen, a hoop that has to jump through before it'll allow it to actually, actually do it. So we can actually watch a system call being fired and we can see how the kernel handles it by using strace. And that traces the execution of any program and it lists any system call that that program will generate as well as any signals that it receives in response. So I have an example here of systrace on hostname and each line in there will correspond to a single system call. So I run that systrace and I get a, a, a line for every system call that's made. For each system call, the name is listed followed by the arguments and the return values. So let's, I think probably the next thing to do is to actually go set one up and let's go look at it. So let me get out of there and we'll do that. Um, let's just get out of that directory altogether. And let's do uh, an S trace. You don't have to be root to do this because you can execute programs. Uh, and the one I would, let's take the host name one that we just did there. So first of all, what am I expecting to get before we do that? So I want the name of the host and that's the expected return. But what does it do? How does this actually work? So you can, you can see quite a bit happening here. There's the beginning of the sys trace, there's my command. 
And then this is the execution. So this is actually starting up. So this is SysTrace actually starting the hostname application. And it found it in user bin. And then this is the arguments that's passed. And if you've programmed at all in, in Linux, you know that argument zero is always the name of the command. If there had been any additional arguments, they would be listed here. And then this, of course, is the memory address that's given to it as to the location of the uh, of the host name. Then it sets up some architectural protocols. It then begins to access libraries that have uh, that syscall in it and in an attempt to try to resolve what to do with that that hostname command. So it's setting up memory, it's starting to read the libraries, it's starting to read air, uh, code out of the libraries, and then it starts to execute and write data back into memory. It then does a close, the architecture comes back in and does some stuff, and then finally it decides to execute uname with the probably the node name bits the option and then gets a return uh, for the MSIL. So as you can see, that hostname is kind of inefficient because uh, it's gonna it's gonna do nothing more than call uname and uname is actually gonna call it back. So if I did a uname minus n, that would be more efficient than doing this. So there you go. Now you know. Now you have some tools that start to show you. Gee, am I doing this the most efficient way, or is this really just generating more work than it needs to do? So, uh, if I did an S trace on, oh, I don't know. Uh, well, still, I guess we could do that. We could do uh, you name. Uh, that's not going to work. So, so let's see. It should be a lot shorter. So it set up, yeah, it skipped. Well, no, it didn't skip. All the same protocol steps are the same. But in this instance, it's already ready to fire out the, the result. So it was a lot more efficient to get it there. And then this return result right here that it's writing back is what ends up uh, back on my stack for my application, which would be the shell in this case that requested it. So that's it. There's nothing more to it than that. And you can play around with all of the, any of the commands that you want and, and you know, and, and see what, what uh, you know, how those things work. There's other system calls that you'll see. Uh, if you did like a PS, a, an S trace of PS, you'll see probably some sort of the most inefficient coding I have ever seen in my life where it actually tracks through every proc file that's out there of a process that's running to identify if it belongs to you. Unix doesn't, Linux doesn't have any mechanism to determine what you're actually running. It actually has to go search through the entire process stack to find which ones you own and which ones you're running. So if you just did a PS by itself, that's probably the most inefficient way to find anything because it's got to go look through everything and then, and then one line at a time it has to return it back to you. So, yeah, so yeah, you'll start to see things like that where you, you know, if you're trying to do things in the quickest way, the fastest way, syscalls is an interesting way, to kind of, and, and strace is kind of an interesting way to see how things are running. If you're running an application and you want to see if you're doing things in a, in, you know, how your, how your, your machine and how your application is responding. S trace is a really good tool to be able to go in and analyze your application to see how well you're doing things. And you can play, you know, if you have the time, we don't always have the time when we're developing to play around with uh, potentially new things, but there's a lot of different ways to do things. Uh, and maybe there's a better and a more efficient way of getting at the data that you need or pushing data back out someplace else that you need. Anyway, uh, Next time, we'll talk about process management and we'll delve into that. But I just want to talk about syscalls first because it all starts with that, a syscall. <laughs> so without it, nothing in the kernel will happen as far as my application programs are concerned. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, I, I, hope you, I hope this was useful for you. Uh, if it was, let me know. Uh, you know, there's always things that you're gonna. I'm gonna skip over. 
I'm not going to cover, I'm not, I don't want to get down into the weeds so deep that you fall asleep or people that have no idea what this means or what it's doing. But uh, I, I don't want to, I don't want to bore them. So basically, this is just kind of a high level. If you want to explore more out in the, uh, out in the, the Linux kernel, where you go to get the uh, archives for the kernel, there are, is a huge amount of documentation that will go through different parts of the system. Um, they'll go through, usually what you'll find out there is that for every release, they'll, they'll have sections of manuals that talk about what's been introduced. So if you want to piece all this together, the only way to do it is to go to the, the last LTS release that uh, had some major change that you were interested in and start there. Uh, be, you know, I, I don't know how many times, when we get to process management, that's gonna be a really a, a hard one to try to put together because Linux has changed about six times on how it does its scheduling and how it does its process managing. So yeah, it'll be an interesting one to cover. Hope to see you then. And uh, please like and subscribe. And as always, bye for now. Mm -hmm.